Сегодня у нас Валентин Гаранко из университета Стокгольма. Доклад по модальной логике и, и, и отчасти это теория вероятностей. Вот. Значит, доклад будет по-английски. Но я думаю, ага. можно начать. Можно, можно сейчас как это? Поделить свайдой? Да, да, да. Yes. Видно? Да, прекрасно. Что, начинаем? Или пока нет? Control L, full screen. Лучше. Да. У меня есть вот такой технический проблем с full screen. Вот этот панел я, я, я не могу... Вот, uh, I, I can't remove this. So, but anyway. uh, shall I... Shall I begin or we are still waiting for others? Yes, yes. Спасибо. Я сначала я попробую сказать несколько слов по-русски, потом перехожу на английский. Я очень рад за возможность выступить на этом семинаре и хочу поблагодарить Валентина Борисовича за приглашение. Я хотел бы, мог рассказать моего доклада по-русски, но, к сожалению, я так много забыл русскую грамматику, что все, я все подъезжи употребляю почти случайным способом, равномерным распределением. Так что я буду докладывать по-английски, по но если вы, у вас есть вопросы какие-то, ну, можно меня спрашивают либо по-русски, либо по-английски, я буду отвечать по-английски. Окей, so uh, here is the, uh, the title of, of uh, my talk, The Model Logic of Almost Sure for Invalidities in the Finite. And uh, I would like to first uh, say a few words about the prehistory of this work, which goes back over 20 years in the past. And uh, It was somewhat a dramatic story at the beginning, and uh, I, I apologize, some of you already know the story, I have heard it probably more than once, but nevertheless, I'll tell the others. Uh, so uh, the story goes back in the late 1990s when uh, I got interested in uh, zero one laws in various logics, and in particular, I came across this paper by Halpern and Capron on zero one laws for model logic, Uh, we, in which the main result that was claimed and proved there was that uh, zero one law holds for frame validity in model logic, and I will explain in my talk what that means. Now, the proof, so I was quite interested in reading it, and uh, the proof of this uh, claim was, uh, well, at least 10 pages long, uh, hard, tough combinatorial probabilistic calculations with essentially no logic involved, so that I could not really Uh, understand the proof, and I asked various people, including the authors, and no, no one could explain uh, the proof to me, so I thought it would be uh, a good idea to uh, come up with an alternative proof that is accessible for model logicians, at least. Uh, so, well, uh, I, uh, I got in touch with uh, Bruce Kippen, it's the second author of this paper, and uh, he was so kind to arrange uh, financing for my visits to him and the uh, University of Victoria in uh, British Columbia. Uh, and so I went there at the beginning of the year 2000 for two months of Sepan's kind of uh, a research visit uh, with the purpose of uh, for, uh, well, finding such an alternative proof. So Bruce was not really into this topic anymore, but he was kind to uh, well, uh, listen to me and, and we discuss things. Uh, but anyway, so I uh, worked really uh, hard uh, for two months and uh, unfortunately I could not uh, find such a proof. Instead, I uh, managed to prove something else which then uh, raised a very serious doubt in the correctness of the claim itself. So it became a bit embarrassing. You go and visit someone and then you disprove the results. That's not very 
uh, nice thing to do. But well, anyway, so uh, the result of that uh, visit and that work was a paper which, uh, uh, well, we completed in the year 2000, but it took a couple of years to publish. And it was about the model logic of the countable random frame. And since it plays uh, a very essential role in the, the whole story, then I will also uh, mention uh, some of the main results there later. So anyway, uh, one of the results there, which I'll uh, explain later, uh, was the failure of the so-called transfer theorem, which was the, let's say, the main tool for proving <clears throat> almost all zero one laws that had been known by that time. And so then I started really doubting uh, that this uh, result holds, but I could not disprove it either. So uh, I uh, managed to find and, and recruit a, a young uh, French guy who had proved quite uh, well, strong and, and non-trivial uh, counterexamples to zero and low in some uh, extensions of uh, first order logic to well, fragments of existential monadic sector logic. And he didn't know model logic, but I told him what this was about. And uh, in a couple of years, he came up with a counterexample, and so that he published uh, this paper in Leaks 2002, where he actually disproved the zero one law. And the counterexamples were at least as hard to understand and to, to, to verify as the original proof of uh, this uh, result published in the, uh, by uh, Halpern and Capon. And uh, it's not a secret anymore, but I had to review this paper and I was sitting between two uh, equally hard and difficult proofs, and I had to judge which one of them was correct. But I already had the, well, let's say, the, the hunch of uh, what is true, and so that I managed to verify uh, Lubar's proof, and that was the end of the story. Soon thereafter, they published an eratum, and so that is the uh, end of that story, and that's also the beginning of uh, my talk, because th it is then when the uh, question of, uh, well, axiomatizing or identifying, characterizing the model logic of, uh, of uh, almost sure validity in the finite uh, became a really interesting uh, uh, problem task. And so I started working uh, on that problem then, uh, but then soon thereafter I stopped for various reasons. And it was only recently when I uh, well uh, resumed my work and I, um, so I managed to make some, some progress on it, which uh, I uh, published in the advances of model logic this year. So that what I will present here will be essentially a talk on that paper. And uh, again, at least Evgeny, whom I see the box here, knows very well the story. So uh, sorry, Evgeny, you have to hear it again, but uh, I hope that that might spark your interest in it again. Now, so uh, here is a brief outline of my talk, I will start with uh, a brief background on asymptotic probabilities, on logical formulae and zero one laws and almost sure validities. And then I will give some model logic background if uh, necessary. And then I will focus on the model logic of the countable random frame, which is uh, part of the main story, namely the model logic of almost sure form validities in the finite. And uh, you're most welcome to interrupt me with questions during my talk, so we can, we can uh, make it interactive. Okay, so first background on asymptotic probabilities and zero one laws. <laughs> so uh, consider a fixed finite relational signature, and it suffices to think of a single binary relation. And then we uh, define a probability space, call it SN, on the set of N element uh, structures for that signature over the set of natural numbers one to n, and we can assume uniform distribution, though this is not really essential to, for most of what I'll say, but I can come back to this later. Uh, so then we can define a classical discrete probability, since this is a finite space, so we, uh, we can define a classical discrete probability of a property P of uh, uh, L structures uh, to hold in a randomly chosen structure from that space, and I will denote that probability in this way. Uh, so uh, this, I will call the labeled probability, the property P and labeled because the label, the elements of the structure are supposed to be labeled with uh, 
the natural numbers, and that makes it much easier to compute these probabilities. There is an alternative way to consider a structure of subtraction morphism, and that would be the unlabeled case. I'll say something about this later. Okay. Well, then next, we can define the asymptotic probability of the property P by taking the limit of the probability PR sub n as n tends to infinity. And if that limit exists, then uh, I uh, would denote it this way, and, uh, and uh, I'll call it the asymptotic probability of the property P. Now, <clears throat> notice that uh, this probability measure is not countably additive, but still it's finitely additive, and it is quite a reasonable um, probability measure. Now, <clears throat> if this asymptotic probability is one, then the property P is said to be almost surely true in the finite or in the context of uh, frame validity, uh, I'll rather talk about almost surely valid in the finite property. Accordingly, if the, uh, this asymptotic probability is zero, then we say that the property P is almost surely false or almost surely invalid in the finite. So, um, yes, uh, just for the record, uh, by a frame, I mean any binary relational structure that is a set and the binary relation on it. Uh, so in that sense, a directed graph, yes? Right. A directed graph is a loopless frame, that is a frame with an irreflexive relation. And a graph that is undirected graph is directed graph with a symmetric edge relation, or we can treat it as such. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned this because I will list uh, some examples of almost surely true properties on graphs, for instance, connectedness, uh, containing a k-click, being Hamiltonian, and so on. And these are not all obvious properties, and uh, some of them, for instance, Hamiltonicity is not obvious at all to prove. Uh, but also, uh, very importantly, rigidity. The structure is rigid if it has no known trivial automorphisms. And rigidity is, uh, is an almost surely true property, which therefore means that if we, instead of the labeled probabilities, we consider the unlabeled ones, that is, we consider structures up to isomorphism, then the asymptotic probabilities will be equal because the class of the, I mean, on the rigid structures, there won't be a difference. But uh, of course, it's much, uh, much more uh, convenient to. Uh, deal with uh, labeled probabilities because they are much easier to compute. So anyway, it, it makes no difference. Right. And some examples of almost surely false properties that would include, for instance, planarity, k ability, being Coilium, being tree-like, and so on. And uh, in fact, every universal property is almost surely false for reasons that you will see soon. Every non-trivial universal property, I mean. Okay, and so yes, if there are graph theories here, I don't see why well, I don't know, but I, I like to tease them that, uh, well, they work with, uh, well, with class of structures of uh, asymptotic measure zero <laughs> within, within frames, that is, well, okay, you get the point. Now, <clears throat> so next, countable random structures. So uh, fix any finite relational signature uh, L, and it turns out that there exists a, a very special countable random structure, which I'll denote by RL. In the case of a single binary relation, this is the um, no, this is known as Erdős Reni model. And for graphs, this is the uh, well known Vadu graph, or sometimes it's also known as Erdős graph. It's also under various names, and it's a very, very interesting structure on its own, but I only mention it now in passing. Uh, but uh, so the, the most important property of such structures is that any uniformly randomly chosen countable L structure is isomorphic with probability one to RL. And uh, unless you ask me, I'll not explain exactly how we uniformly choose randomly uh, an infinite structure, but uh, you can think of an experiment like, well, for instance, for every edge tossing a coin and uh, assigning the edge, uh, that is for every pair of elements, you toss a coin and then you assign uh, an edge if the coin is heads, otherwise not, or something like this. So anyway, uh, this is really very uh, interesting and for many people, including myself, it's counterintuitive, but uh, nevertheless true. Now, 
Uh, it turns out that there is a, a simple and very elegant logical characterization of this counter-random structure RL by means of an infinite set of so-called extension axioms. And uh, I will uh, show these extension axioms in the case of frames, that is, well, binary relational structures. So uh, for every n, there is one uh, scheme of extension axioms denoted in this way. And uh, I will briefly read what this formula, which I've highlighted, says. Basically, it says for every antipole of uh, elements x1 to xn, there is an element y, which is related to the elements of this antipole in any uh, a priori prescribed way. That is, for every n different points in the frame, there is a point which is related to those in a way that we can explicitly prescribe here by saying that it relates to, to these axes and does not relate to those axes in either direction. And so this is essentially a saturation property uh, which you can recognize. Okay, so, so again, we have an infinite uh, range of schemes of such extension axioms. And now here is an old and very nice result by Geithman, 1964, uh, who proved that a countable L structure satisfies all extension axioms if and only if it is isomorphic to RL. And that in a sense, I mean, the proof of this generalizes Cantor's theorem, for instance, characterizing the order of rationals to isomorphism within the countable uh, linear orders. And uh, as an immediate corollary, we have that the first order theory axiomatized with all extension axioms is omega categorical and has no finite models, of course, and therefore it is complete and decidable. That is, it is as nice as it gets. Right. Now, uh, so uh, from now on, I will not talk more about any countable random structures, but the countable random frame that is the unique countable model for the extension axioms or frames. And I'll denote it in this way by FR. Okay. Next, Fagin in 1975 proved a very uh, interesting result that every extension axiom is almost surely true in the finite. And it was a, a technical result, and he proved it by oh, standard, more or less standard probabilistic combinatorial calculations. Uh, and uh, now here is a very important uh, follow-up from that result, which is known as Fagin's transfer theorem, that for every L structure psi, the following are uh, equivalent, sorry, for every L sentence psi, the following are uh, equivalent. Uh, first, uh, psi is true in the countable random structure for L, if and only if psi follows from finitely many extension axioms, uh, if and only if psi is almost surely true in the finite, and uh, so from uh, these three, since for every sentence, either uh, psi no, or not psi is true in the countable random structure, so we obtain as immediate corollary the so-called zero-one law for first-order logic, namely every first-order property of relational structures is either almost surely true or almost surely false in the finite. And so this is what Fagin proved in 1975, but what he did not know is that uh, this result was essentially established already in 1969 by uh, Glebski, Kogan, Yogonki, and Tawanov uh, in the paper Abion Idolia Vipaunimus Tiformu Uskovich Cislinia Predicatov, which was published in the Journal of Kibernetica, uh, which, uh, as far as I know, at least at that time, was probably only available in Russian and it was not accessible in the West, or maybe it was, but anyway. Uh, the point is that the proof uh, in, uh, of this result, in this paper that I've just mentioned, uh, follows an, a completely different idea, and it's based on what one can call almost sure quantifier elimination. And it's also a very interesting idea, and it was used uh, much later by Tian Grandjean to prove that uh, the complexity of checking whether a given first order sentence is uh, almost surely true in the finite is p space. So of course, uh, decidability follows already from the uh, zero one law. But well, you can immediately compare the striking difference with the case of 
uh, absolute uh, validity in the finite, well, we know from Trachtenbach's trio that uh, this is not even recursively axiomatizable. So that, well, if put it in a philosophical terms, if you are prepared to give up on absolute validity in the finite, but be happy with almost sure validity, then all of a sudden you're down to a relatively low uh, decidable problem. Okay, whether you like it or not. Okay, so uh, next, uh, the, uh, what about model logic? What about model logic? Uh, the case of model logic, uh, well, First of all, there are two notions of validity in the structure of model formulae. Validity in a Kutke model, which I'll call model validity, and validity in a Kutke frame, and the frame validity. So model validity, as uh, most of you probably know, is a first order property because of the standard translation of model logic into first order logic uh, with respect to uh, um, validity in Kutke frames, uh, sorry, Kutke models. And therefore, we have an immediate corollary from Fagin's theorem that uh, both transfer theorem and zero one law hold for validity of model formulae in Kripke models. And uh, in fact, in the paper that I mentioned to the beginning, Halper and Kitrin show that the model logic of almost sure model validity is precisely the already quite well known Carnap's model logic, which is axiomatized by set of axioms looking like this. So take any consistent classical propositional formula, put a diamond in front, take them all, and this is the uh, axiomatization of this logic. So clearly this is not a normal model logic. It's not close to the uh, uniform uh, substitutions. But anyway, so the question of how almost sure validity uh, uh, in terms of Kripke models, uh, in terms of finite Kripke models look, that question was completely uh, explored and, and, and answered uh, in this paper, and there is essentially nothing more to say. Now, question: What uh, about is this logic one? closed yes. under necessitation? Uh, closed under necessitation. I, yeah, I believe it is. Yes, I believe it is, but it's not closed under uniform substitution. So it's so, not a logic. It's not. It's normal, but not a logic. Rather that okay. than logic, but <laughs> right. not. Okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I take the point. Yes, <laughs> good. Thank you. Right. So anyway, uh, I mentioned uh, that one just in passing because the really interesting question now is what about zero one law for frame validity in model logic? Now, the point is that uh, that is the question is whether uh, every model formula is either almost surely valid or almost surely invalid in finite frames. And so the problem is that frame validity of a model formula is not a first order property, but it is a universal monadic second order property. So anyway, zero one law uh, for uh, frame validity does not follow from Fagin's theorem. And in fact, there are many counter examples of zero one law when we extend first order logic into second order logic, even universal or existential. So, uh, Indeed, well, one of the main results in uh, our paper with Kipling was that the analog of the transfer theorem, uh, which I mentioned uh, earlier, proved by Fagin, for model frame validity does not hold. And that is the result which cast a serious doubt on the uh, uh, zero one law. And indeed, uh, even though it was, uh, as I said, it was claimed to hold and it was proved, but it was later refuted. Uh, in 2002. I say later because our work was still a couple of years earlier and Labas based his work on ours. But anyway, uh, so zero one law for frame validity does not hold. And now to the main topic of my uh, talk, the theory of almost sure validity is in the finite for a given logic. Now, this is a rather generic notion. So let me explain that. Uh, consider any logic L that has semantics, which is defined inter alia or arbitrarily large finite models. And then uh, let us denote by L uh, with superscript AS, the set of formulae of L that are almost surely true in the finite in terms of this semantics. So notice that LAS contains all validities of the logic L and it is closed under any finitary 
rules of inference, that is, being a very logical consequence as well, because of the finite additivity of the asymptotic probability measure. <clears throat> so that, generally speaking, LAS is a well-defined logical theory or logic uh, over L. And so the generic problem uh, arises to find a purely logical, either axiomatic or model theoretic characterization of this logic LAS. Now, the easy case is when the zero one law holds due to a transfer theorem, because like in first order logic, because then we know that this logic is precisely the theory or the logic of the countable random structure for the uh, logic L. And that pretty much says it all. And in case of first order logic, we have both model theoretic and axiomatic characterization and uh, nothing really more to say. There. However, <clears throat> what about if such a structure does not exist uh, or when uh, the transfer theorem uh, or even the zero one law itself fails? Well, so it, it seems that uh, this question in, in cases like this is uh, very, very difficult and uh, I am, I speak under some correction, but I'm not aware of any explicit result that characterizes such logic or even implicitly in case when there is no zero and law. Right, so uh, in the rest of my talk, I'll give a partial answer or some, some partial characterization of how that logic looks in the case of model logic. But uh, I'll say from the outset that it seems to be quite hard and difficult to characterize logically. So, <clears throat> All right, uh, I will give a brief background to model logic because, uh, well, looking at the audience, I, I know most of the people at least by name, so I presume that that would not be necessary, but still, uh, let me do it. Uh, so consider two uh, frames and a mapping F1 and F2, and mapping from F1 to F2 is called uh, a bounded morphism, also known as p-morphism. Uh, if first it is a homomorphism, so uh, if the relation holds between X and Y in the first structure, then the corresponding relation holds between the images. And uh, second, uh, whenever uh, we take a, an X from W1 and T from W2, if the relation holds between H of X and T, then there is some pre-image of T with respect to H, an element Y in uh, W1, such that the relation uh, holds between X and Y. Okay. So uh, if the mapping cage is on two, then uh, I'll call, uh, so F uh, will be called a bounded morphic image of F2 will be called a bounded morphic image of F1. And uh, so the claim that F2 is a bounded morphic image of M1 will be denoted in this way. Now, uh, recall that for invalidity of model formula is preserved under bounded morphisms. So that is. Uh, next observation is that, well, every mapping from uh, a frame G to a frame F, in particular the bounded morphism, defines in a uniform way a so called kernel partition uh, in, the, um, in the source, uh, that is in the frame G. This is the uh, partition. Uh, consisting of the family of pre-images of elements of F with respect to H. So uh, the fact that it, uh, H is a bounded morphism is not essential here, but of course, if H is a bounded morphism, then there are some uh, uh, properties, some conditions that are satisfied by this kernel partition, which can be easily extracted from the definition of bounded morphism. Now, conversely, for every kernel partition in G, uh, which is uh, so every kernel partition in G, which is generated by a mapping H from G to F, if it satisfies these certain conditions, which I'm not listing here, then that mapping H is a bounded morphism from G onto F. That is, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between kernel partitions satisfying certain simple conditions and bounded morphic images of a given frame. And it is sometimes more intuitive to uh, reason in terms of kernel partitions and the, uh, in the given frame, 
rather than in terms of its bounded morphic images, and in particular in the context of what I'll present here. Okay, next, uh, I want to say a few words about this countable random frame FR. Uh, and so uh, there are many things to say about it, but uh, one important fact uh, which is very easy to uh, observe, is that uh, this frame has a diameter too, meaning that every point can be reached from any point, including from itself, in two steps. And that is the case because uh, one of the extension axioms, which are <coughs> to the countable random frame, is the one which says that for x1 and x2, there is a y such that rx1 y and ry x2. And that exactly says what I, uh, what I mentioned. So FR has a diameter two, and since this extension axiom is almost sure, surely true in the finite, then uh, the subset of uh, all finite frames of diameter two has asymptotic measure one in the set of all finite frames. That is, well, the property of a finite frame to have a diameter two is almost surely true in the finite. And so uh, this is important because uh, it, it, it follows immediately that any property of frames uh, is almost surely true in the set of all finite frames precisely when it is almost surely true on the subset of uh, finite frames of diameter two. And so that's uh, as far as almost sure truth or, or validity in particular is concerned, uh, we can really ignore all frames that do not have a, a diameter two and focus only on those that do. Okay, next uh, simple observation which follows immediately from this one is that uh, the universal modality is easily definable, almost surely <laughs> definable, that is definable in frames of diameter two. So uh, yes, do I need to say what the universal modality is? I hope not, but otherwise ask me. Uh, and so I'll be denoting the universal modality in this way by u in a box and the respective dual existential modality by u in uh, angle brackets, diamond u. Uh, so uh, they are simply definable in every frame of diameter to namely double box, respectively double diamond. And uh, therefore these equivalences, so if you think of the universal modality in the proper sense, that is, uh, the modality over the Cartesian square of the, of the domain, uh, so that we can read this both as a definition, but also as an, as an equivalence. And this equivalence holds in almost every finite frame, because almost every finite frame has a diameter too, and it also holds in Fi. So that hereafter I'll treat this uh, box U and diamond U both uh, or either as primitives or as definable, whichever suits us, but basically any result that I will, uh, I will mention from now on will respectively apply in one and the other case. And so not to overload uh, the presentation technically, I'll simply with a very slight abuse, I'll assume that it's either definable or, the, uh, or it is primitive in the, in the language. All right, next, again, something that uh, probably all of you know quite well. Uh, I will define a sort of characteristic formula for finite frames that would uh, bear a uh, very similar idea to uh, a formula that were introduced by Yankov in the context of uh, intuitionistic logic and uh, probably independently or not by Kit Fine in the context of, of model logic. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I will only uh, use them for a very specific purpose here. So uh, here is the definition. Take any finite frame F with uh, an, an element domain and uh, fix N different propositional variables, P1 to Pn. And then the characteristic formula of F over uh, this tuple of variables is the formula in the language with universal modality defined as follows. So this is not universal box of delta f of p1 to pn, where delta f is what one can call the model diagram of the frame f, 
where we essentially treat the variables P1 to Pn as nominals, that is, as respectively um, interpreted to be true only at the worlds W1 respectively Wn, so that the formula delta F of P1 to Pn explicitly says the following, that first, uh, every Pi is true somewhere, and also uh, that uh, every point uh, satisfies some uh, Pi, and that they are true in different points. So that basically the top line says that indeed each one of them is true at one and only one point and every point corresponds to a variable. And then the second line describes the accessibility relation in terms of what is reachable from what and what is not reachable from what. Okay, so it's essentially the diagram of the, of the frame. Okay, and so, uh, Assuming that uh, P1 to Pn are fixed or known from the context, I'll, uh, in the future, I'll simply write chi f without specifying the variables. Okay, oh, so here is a fact which, as I understand, uh, is a folklore fact, or at least Evgeny told me so. By the way, I want to use the opportunity to thank Evgeny, uh, Evgeny Zolin, who uh, for uh, many uh, valuable comments and uh, corrections that he made on several versions of uh, this paper. Uh, so, and uh, well, he also told, I mean, in particular, he, he told me that as far as he knows, this claim is also a folklore, so that I cannot attribute it to anyone, but if that's not the case, then let me know. So anyway, there are several claims that are folklore, but I will only mention two that would be essential for what follows, namely for any frame G and a finite frame F, the following are equivalent that F is a finite uh, bounded, uh, sorry, F is a bounded morphic image of G, if and only if the characteristic formula of F is not valid in G. Well, indeed, that is quite easy to see because not valid means that there is a valuation that would falsify this formula. That is, uh, that valuation will satisfy what follows after the negation. And what follows after the negation essentially says that in the frame G, there is a kernel partition that corresponds to a bounded morphism onto F. That is, in a nutshell, the reason for this. So, sorry, may yes. I ask at uh, this point? Go it ahead. seems that the, 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 the first should not be uh, more precisely formulated that not the, the whole frame is uh, mapped P morphically, but only it's a rooted subframe, rooted generated subframe. In the Which presence one? of universal modality, every ah, if you have is, root, yeah. is rooted. Ah, uh, because of, yes. because of this point. Yes, yes. I see. I see. Yeah, but, uh, thanks with the for, universal yeah. modality, it does not. Matter. It simplifies. It simplifies many yeah. things there uh, when you have it, and so it's a very useful thing, as as we all know. Okay, right. Thanks. So, <clears throat> excuse me. By the way, how am I doing time-wise? And uh, because I forgot when we started and when we are supposed to finish. So how much more time uh, we do started, I have to leave in? A, yep. Yeah, we started at least 10 minutes later. So you, you, okay. have, you have at least, I think, 55 minutes. Right. OK, so I, I hope that I'll finish within about uh, half an hour so that to, to leave uh, uh, enough time for questions and discussion. Okay, okay. But uh, again, feel free to interrupt me and ask your questions as I go. All right, now let me say a few words about uh, these two model logics. Uh, the first one, MLR, is the model logic of the countable random frame, and the second one is the model logic of all formulae, which are most surely valid in the, on finite frames. And the second one is the main, the main uh, subject of this, of this work. But as we'll see, uh, it is uh, well, essentially related to the first one, as one can expect. So uh, here are some uh, results that uh, follow from uh, our paper with Capron. First of all, uh, these both, uh, both these logics are normal model logics, and they are normal in the normal sense of the word. So they are closed under everything that you can think. And uh, second, uh, and uh, even more important is that uh, a, any model formula phi is in the logic MLR if and only if the frame condition that it defines follows from some extension action. 
So the frame condition is generally a universal, it's a pi one one property, but still we can talk about logical consequence from uh, first order uh, sentences so that uh, this uh, I hope makes good sense. And that um, is, uh, yes. Um, may I ask a question about the right. word follows? Yes. Does it mean for any frame or for any finite frame or is it there is no difference between these? Um, for, I believe for every frame, not just every finite, but for every frame. I, I need to think a bit more, but yes. So the answer is for every frame because the extension axioms, uh, they of course can be applied to, uh, uh, to all frames. And it's essentially a compactness property there, which mm -hmm. can be extended yes, if to- If compactness then of course for every frame. Of Pardon me? Uh, if it is compactness, then of course for every frame, yes. because yes. finite frames are not com compact. Yes. In first but, sense. So uh, I promise after this talk that I will check all my answers that I gave, which uh, are expressed as beliefs. And uh, if any of these beliefs turn out not to be <laughs> to be a false belief, then I will report back. But uh, I, I think I'm pretty sure that uh, yes, it, it follows in the standard logical sense on all frames. Right, and therefore every such a formula is in MLAS. Right, well, uh, back to this. Uh, in, indeed, uh, I believe that it follows uh, uh, in, in the standard sense that is considering all frames, but for all practical purposes, I can restrict attention to everything that I will say from now on, unless otherwise specified to uh, only finite frames or to the countable random frame. That would be the only infinite uh, structure that I will mention in my talk, everything else will be or can be assumed to be finite. Right, so consequently, the first logic MLR is included in the logic MLAS. And the big question is whether this inclusion is strict or not. That is, whether there are any formulae uh, which are almost surely valid in the finite, but are not valid in the countable random frame. And so I'll give an answer to this question soon. And uh, you know, to give that answer, uh, I want to uh, uh, to say a few more things about the logic MLR, which was uh, well again the, the main uh, the main object of, uh, of study of uh, our paper with Caitlin. Uh, in particular, we obtained a complete axiomatization of that logic, which uh, turned out to be an extension of the standard complete axiomatization of the model logic with universal modality, uh, with one. Uh, infinite scheme of, of axioms, which in a sense, well, simulates in model logic what the extension axiom says, uh, well, what the extension axioms say in first order logic. So that this is the mod x scheme for every n. Uh, we have one scheme like this. And uh, intuitively, the frame condition which this mod x uh, n defines is that for every set of endpoints, so every set of endpoints in the in the frame has a common predecessor, which is also their common successor. So that if you apply this uh, axiom to frames of at most endpoints, then that simply means that in every such a frame, uh, this extension, uh, this axiom mod x n implies existence of a, what I call a central point. So this is a point in the frame, which is related to and from every point in the frame, including itself. Okay, so frames with central points play, will play a central role in what I will say further. Uh, and now here is the, um, <clears throat> probably the other main result in the paper with Capron that the model logic MLR is not finitely axiomatizable, but nevertheless, it does have finite model property and it is actually decidable, and well, we don't know the exact complexity, but it is within exponential time. So it's it's an interesting creature. And this logic yes. is a unimodal, so you, the universal operator, should be understood as box box. Exactly. Yes, you can think of them as as the definable double boxes and double diamonds. So, but you can also think of it in the language with universal modality. So both results hold equally. And do we miss the substitution rule? It is uh, not mentioned here. Well, I consider schemes. I, uh, yeah, no, you're right. I say, uh, I, I thought that I uh, consider schemes, but they are called axioms. So yes, there is a substitution. So thank you. I should fix that. 
Um, but yes, so uh, it's this is a normal model logic in the standard sense, and it's posed under uh, not only under the citation but also under substitution clearly. Right. Okay. So uh, well, uh, from all that is on this slide, the really important observation is the one about the frames with a central point, and so uh, I'll give you two examples which will play a certain role. In what follows, two examples of uh, finite frames with a central point, K2 given on the left and K3 given on the right. So you can see clearly the central points. Now, each one of these generates a kernel partition in the source frames. And interestingly, the kernel partition generated by K2 corresponds precisely to a very standard and well-known notion of a kernel in directed graphs. Uh, which uh, is uh, well studied uh, and, and uh, well, there is a lot to say about kernels in well, both directed and undirected graphs, but uh, I will not uh, say more, except maybe it's interesting to note that it was proved some, uh, sometime in the 90s that the existence of a kernel in both directed or uh, undirected graph is an almost surely true in the finite property. And not only that, but the size of the kernel is almost with, with probability one is very precisely given as log n minus log log n, where n is the size, the number of points in the graph. So that there are some very interesting facts about kernels, but uh, that is aside from my talk. So anyway, uh, this defines precisely the notion of a kernel in digraphs, whereas K3 defines the notion that I haven't seen studied in, in graph theory, but I call it a double kernel for well, reasons that you can see. Okay, so. so now, we, uh, Valentin, can you remind us what, what you call, call a kernel in a graph? So uh, a kernel partition, I, uh, I defined kernel partition. It's, uh, uh, ah, sorry, kernel in a graph, sorry. Uh, kernel in a graph is a subset of vertices of the graph, which has two properties. One is so-called independence uh, that is, there are no edges between the vertices in the, in the kernel. And the other one is called uh, domination. And it says that every vertex from outside of the kernel has an edge going uh, to a vertex inside the kernel. So, uh, so that these two properties, independence and domination, they together define the notion of a kernel. And uh, you can, so being on this, you can observe that these two properties kind of fight with, e with each other because in a sense that the largest the kernel is or the largest subset is, the less, probably, the, the less probable it is that it is independent and the more probable it is that it is dominating and vice versa. And so that uh, if you pick a random finite graph, then, uh, existence of a kernel there is not obvious at all and it's and certainly it's a non-monotonic property but also the size of this kernel could be just about anything so that it's really uh, impressive and it's one of the many results in graph theory that certain characteristics they have an almost surely precise value when you consider finite graphs and their asymptotic values so it's also chromatic number and others but again that is another story so uh, I'll not go into graph theory here, but I, I, I got to read quite a bit about kernels then because that was uh, something which also I used some results there and some techniques to prove what I will mention now. So anyway, I hope I answered that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, uh, but well, again, I only consider kernels for now in the context of frames and for very specific reasons. Now. Here is another proposition which puts together several properties of uh, finite frames that are equivalent and that characterize precisely the finite frames of the logic MLR. That is every finite frame, for every finite frame, the following are equivalent. First, it is a frame for the logic MLR. Second, it has a central point. Third, it's a bounded morphic image of the countable random frame. Fourth, it uh, invalidates the characteristic, uh, sorry, the countable random frame F R invalidates the characteristic formula of F. And lastly, F can be obtained from F R by filtration. So that all these are equivalent and they basically say all that we want to know about the finite frames of the logic MLR. 
Okay, so uh, one immediate, uh, immediate corollary is that for every finite frame G uh, without a central point, the characteristic formula of that frame is already in MLR. So that it is of no, uh, no further interest for us if we are really looking for uh, additional axioms for MLAS. Okay, now uh, let me say a few words about the failure of transfer theorem because that would justify the claim that these two logics are indeed different. So uh, here is uh, another corollary from the characterization of the previous slide that uh, the countable random frame has all curdle partitions that are defined by finite frames with a central point. That is every kernel partition defined by a finite frame with a central point will uh, exist or there will be such a partition in FR. And in particular, uh, these, uh, well, there will be a single kernel and a double kernel, and therefore both characteristic formulae for K1 and for K2 and for K3 will fail in the countable random frame. So that both characteristic formulae do not belong to the logic MLR. But then the question is, what about the existence of such kernels in the finite, is it almost surely true? As one would expect if there was a transfer theorem. And it turns out that the answer is no. And this is the, well, in a more explicit claim of the uh, result that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so uh, what, uh, what, what uh, I proved there, it was essentially a part of my work, was that the existence of a double kernel is almost surely false in finite frames. And therefore, the characteristic formula of K3 is an almost surely valid in the finite formula, but it is not in MLR for reasons that I mentioned. And the proof of that was, again, no model logic. It's combinatorial uh, probabilistic estimates and, uh, well, doing some mathematics there. Uh, it was a useful exercise for me, but it also showed me that these kind of questions, they can be quite non-trivial, even for very simple structures or for, for very simple uh, types of partitions. And in fact, I first tried to prove that for a single kernel, it turned out that the mathematics or the calculations, they are much more difficult to carry out so that I could not, so that I, I managed to do that for double kernel. But it was later proved also for single kernels by the bus. So anyway, the important corollary from that is that first, the transfer theorem for frame validity model logic fails. And second, and even more important for us is that the logic MLR is strictly included in MLAS. And now the real story begins here because now the question arises, what more should we add to the axiomatization of MLR to axiomatize completely MLAS? What axioms must be added there? So uh, here is a proposition that gives some some answer, even though on the negative side, uh, and it consists of two claims. The first one is that every first order definable model formula, which is in MLAS, is already in MLR. And second is that every model formula, uh, which is uh, almost surely valid in the finite, and it defines a purely universal, that is pi one one frame condition, it is plainly valid, that is logically valid, and therefore it is also in MLR as well. So that uh, these two claims uh, imply that uh, whatever missing axioms were after, but there will be neither first order definable, nor they will be purely universal, will define purely universal frame conditions. And so uh, this is how the quest for this additional missing axiom started. And the question is how to identify them. Now, uh, this is where the characteristic formulae come into play because, uh, well, here is first a simple observation that for every finite frame F, it is a frame for the logic MLAS precisely when its characteristic formula is not almost surely valid. And well, so in a sense that gives us a characterization, but that characterization is already very helpful as long as we cannot easily judge whether a given characteristic formula is or is not almost surely valid. But still, this is a useful and important fact. And consequently, we have that if some formula fails in uh, some almost surely valid formula fails in a given finite frame F, 
then the characteristic formula of that frame is almost surely valid. So that is one natural source for uh, almost surely valid characteristic formulae, if nothing else. Okay, so now uh, a few uh, comments and observations and conjectures about the possible axiomatization of this logic MLAS. So uh, from what I've said so far, it's clear that the natural candidates for additional axioms for the logic MLAS on top of the logic that we have already seen, uh, MLR, those would be the almost surely valid formulae of the type chi f, that is characteristic formulae, for frames which have a central point. And so I explicitly define that set with, with uh, capital Xi AS, just to make it more fancy. All right, so uh, by, uh, by calligraphic C, I denote the set of uh, finite frames with a central point. <coughs> So uh, in other words, this would be precisely the formulae that correspond to frame conditions, sorry, to kernel partitions that are almost surely false in the finite. That's yet another way to say. All right, so here is a, 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 the main conjecture of, of, of my paper that uh, adding all these formulae, that is the, um, the set psi AS, to the axiomatization of the logic MLR completely axiomatizes the logic MLAS. Up to now, I have neither proof nor a disproof of this conjecture, so that the conjecture still stays. Not that I've tried very hard since I uh, completed that paper, I was up to many other things, and so I would like to get back to this, but I'll say something more at the end. Okay, so uh, uh, I'll say something more in well, some support of this conjecture. Let me first introduce a notation. So uh, given a set of formulae gamma and the formula phi, uh, I denote in this way uh, the uh, consequence, the, the semantic consequence of phi from gamma with respect to all finite frames, validity in all finite frames. That is, this means that phi is valid in every finite frame in which all formulae of gamma are valid. So it's a special kind of model logical consequence. And so here is a possibly encouraging observation in support of that conjecture, namely that uh, for any uh, almost surely valid formula phi, it does follow in terms of this model logical consequence from the conjectured axiomatization. But the problem is that this logical consequence is not the standard logical consequence which we axiomatize uh, by axiomatic systems, but it is a consequence in terms of frame validity, and that makes it essentially a higher order property. And there are results going back to uh, Steve Thomason that, well, consequences of this nature, they are usually typically not even recursively axiomatizable. So that, but I'll, uh, maybe I'll say something more about this. Okay, so there are at least two major problems that immediately arise with the question of axiomatizing the logic MLAS or in particular, proving this conjecture, uh, if it is true at all. Uh, so the first problem is how to explicitly identify uh, the uh, axioms in this set, psi AS. And the second is how to prove completeness once we have them all. And so both problems seem to be quite difficult for all that I know so far. So let me say a bit more about the first one. Uh, all right, so first one observation, which shows that the, the, the question for all that uh, I know so far uh, is not, uh, it does not have a simple answer because uh, at least uh, uh, I managed to show that there are infinitely many independent axioms of this type. That is, there is a set of infinitely many characteristic formulae that are all almost surely valid in the finite and uh, none of which follows from all others in terms of this particular consequence. And therefore it cannot follow deductively. Right, and so I'll give you, uh, since I believe that every, every talk should have at least one proof, so I'll give you at least a, a sketch of a simple proof here. Not that I believe this, but I've been told that uh, some people demand this. So uh, here is a sketch of a proof. So uh, the proof is in the pudding, because they say, uh, so for every n, we define the frame Fn as on the picture. 
So that notice that uh, these arrows here are uh, both ways, but the arrows on top go only from left to right. Okay. So now uh, consider this uh, sentence alpha. For all x, there is a y such as rxy and not ryy. So what it says is that every point can see an irreflexive point. Now, this is an instance of the uh, extension axiom x1. But that extension axiom fails in Fn because if you look at this last point, uh, it does not see an irreflexive point, so that it fails there. And therefore, it will fail in uh, every uh, frame G, which uh, for which for which there is a bounded morphism onto F, because uh, alpha in fact is preserved by bounded mor morphic images, which one can see quite easily. So therefore, the set of finite frames G, such that there is no bounded morphism uh, from G onto F, has an asymptotic measure one in uh, the set of all finite frames. That is, uh, this property of not having a bounded morphism onto F, which is equivalent to the frame G validating the characteristic formula for F, this property is almost surely valid in the finite. Right, so that every such a characteristic formula for uh, Xi Fn is indeed an almost surely valid formula. And uh, it remains to, to see that uh, these formulae are independent from each other in the, in the following strong sense. So for every n, uh, I denote by phi with a superscript uh, minus uh, n, the set of all characteristic formulae for Fm, where m is different from n. So all other characteristic formulae except for Xi Fm. And it suffices to observe that uh, the formula Xi Fn does not follow in terms of finite frame validity from that set of all other formulae that are listed there. And it does not follow because all these, are, uh, all these uh, formulae are valid in the frame Fn, and uh, its characteristic formula is not. So again, what this uh, result uh, suggests, but not implies, is that most likely the logic MLAS will not be finitely exomatizable on top of MLR. That we cannot know for sure until we have a complete exomatization, but this I think is a strong indication that this is likely to be the case. And uh, from now on, I will be mostly mention. I will mostly mention some speculations, open problems, conjectures, because uh, the problem is from now on it's it's widely open. But at least let me mention them and and possibly raise some interest in in some of them. So may, okay, may I give Please. a co comment at the previous slide Go because yes. we we ha have not forgot it yet. Uh, it seems that uh, your argument can be slightly worked out to prove the, the even a stronger claim that uh, the the logic is not axiomatizable using finitely many proposition letters because mm -hmm. this is a standard argument yes yeah which I we see. used many times i see yes yeah, maximovas I... observation it, it, uh -huh. it, it is applicable here it seems to me nice Yes, well, of course, look, uh, uh, I mean, the logic MLR itself requires infinitely many propositional variables already. But it's nevertheless, what you say is interesting that on top of that, we still need infinite. Yes, we, we, we need, yeah. Yeah. yes, a very complicated. But, yes, so yeah, thank you. I will, I'll look at this argument uh, in my own time later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, now, next, so look, we are still, uh, well, I'm at least still looking for the missing axioms. Uh, and uh, there is a partial syntactic description of the missing axioms that are at least in the set Xi AS. And uh, that syntactic description uses a nice old result uh, by uh, Johann von Bentham characterizing the first order sentences in the language with uh, one binary relation of the quality that are preserved under bounded morphisms. And so that combining this with extension axioms, I have a sort of a fairly tight but not precise description of how these missing 
axioms might look or rather how their corresponding extension axioms in the, were written in first order logic that is their properties might look uh, but uh, i will i'll leave that uh, i'll leave that question aside. so if you're interested have a look at the paper now so here is a, one big unknown here is whether uh, these are all axioms that is all axioms that are missing are in this set or there are more that are not identifiable in the way that this set is defined. That is by means of almost surely false kernel partitions generated by them. And uh, so, uh, right, in case when these are all axioms, this is the lucky case, then the logic uh, will be recursively axiomatizable uh, over MLR and even uh, it would stand a chance to be decidable too like MLR. That's probably too good to be true, but still one can be optimistic until you face the reality. But if that is not the case, then it's almost certain that the problem of identifying all missing axioms is, is very likely going to go way beyond model logic and to require really complex combinatorial probabilistic calculations and, and uh, methods to be applied here. And I still don't know which is the case. So- A zero one uh, lower in a sense. Uh, well, yeah, that's right. So in a sense, there is a kind of a zero one. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a dichotomy in a sense. It's a dichotomy. It's either the logic would be very nice or the logic would be probably very ugly and probably not even interesting. And in that is whatever results will eventually come up will not say much more about the logic that we already know. I don't know. So let me sum up. Uh, so, uh, it is currently unknown whether this set, Xi AS is uh, even recursive or, or, or not even recursively enumerable, though I conjecture that it is. Uh, and so that's one question that uh, looks like should be easy to answer, but it basically boils down to the question whether given a finite frame, whether you can judge, uh, whether you can decide whether it, it, its characteristic formula is almost surely uh, valid in the finite or not. And uh, so there may be analytic methods out there which are already well known in, in probabilistic combinatorics that can be used to obtain such a general risk because for concrete frames, yes, one can do the arithmetic there, the combinatorics, and there are methods which I already know quite a bit about them, and one can prove or disprove. But uh, to prove a general result, I don't even know how to approach it using, well, let's say, classical mathematics. So that, but still, uh, my conjecture is that yes, it is at least recursively axiomatizable. So, but now the point is that even if that is the case, then the question whether this uh, additional axioms axiomatize completely the logic MLS, AS, still remains open. Uh, and the reason is that uh, we cannot conclude that uh, we have a deductive consequence of phi from this set of axioms because we have this model logical consequence in terms of frame validity, unless or until we have a recursive axiomatization of this notion of, of, of uh, well, model logical consequence in model logic. But like I said, uh, well, at least I don't know such an axiomatization. I, I suspect that there isn't any, which, by the way, does not imply that our logic will not be recursively axiomatizable. So that there is still some non-trivial relationship between these questions, which I haven't figured out exactly, but still I'm not aware of any systematic studies of this notion of logical, cons logical consequence in model logic. And if anyone knows anything more about this, please let me know. It's, I think it's an independent uh, a question of independent interest. And an, another uh, not less interesting question for us, which was by the way raised by Evgeny, is whether this logic is Kripke complete, that is whether it is the model logic of any class of Kripke frames. Uh, why is this open? Well, because we can take the class of all frames which validate uh, uh, almost uh, all the uh, almost surely valid formulae. But then if we look at the consequences, then it could be that some formula that's not almost surely valid may end up to be valid in each one of them. And yet that would not imply that it is almost surely valid in the finite. By the way, notice that 
the set of uh, the set of frames of, of uh, with central point has an asymptotic measure zero in the set of all finite frames, and therefore whatever we can prove within that set will not be really uh, indicative about what happens uh, in general in terms of almost sure validity. But uh, I'll leave that aside for now. So, okay, I'm nearly there now. Uh, so uh, let me say a few more words, a few words about the second main problem on proving completeness. Say, suppose that we eventually obtain a conjectured complete axiomatization, that is, we gather all the missing axioms. And the, the problem of proving completeness is still not less challenging because from all that we know, all the missing axioms are not first order definable, so they are truly second order, and they are very likely not to be canonical. And so that how you prove completeness when you have an infinite set of non-canonical axioms, that is uh, a question on its own. But still, there are some recent results and techniques that I, uh, that I got to know recently, in particular by Nick and uh, Guren Bajenishvili and a couple of others that give some hope, but I'm yet to explore. And I had a chat with Nick and Guren and they are, for now, they are not very optimistic that these results can be applied here, but uh, who knows? Okay, so, well, still, how difficult that problem is may only be properly assessed when we uh, already know explicitly all the missing actions, and we are not there yet. So that in summary, the question of establishing a probably complete axiomatization of the model logic of almost short frame validity in a finite, while it is now better understood than it was, let's say, 20 years back, but it still remains widely open. And uh, let me now say a few words about further agenda and list a few more uh, uh, interesting open problems. Uh, well, there are many related problems that arise here uh, with respect to the generic question of characterizing mod uh, well, logics of almost sure validity in the finite. So that now I go beyond this concrete question here. So here is one generic question. I mean, take a class of Kripke frames, let's say all reflexive or transitive or partial or whatever. And the question is, what is the model logic of all sure validities relative or, uh, relativized to that class? Now, uh, it, it may look that uh, this question would be even more difficult than the question for the class of all finite, that is for the logic K, but that might not be the case because uh, I'll say something soon. But, so uh, certainly in the case when the respective model logic of this class satisfies the zero one law, which is quite possible for some uh, special classes of frames that zero one law can be restored. Uh, it, well, it seems that this case is considerably easier, but by no means trivial. Uh, do and, you mean here yes. the cl a class of finite frames? A, no a class of finite here. frames, yes. But I mean, so if you take a class of finite frames that does not have an asymptotic measure one, let's say take one with measure zero, like, well, uh, again, some universal class, then uh, whatever uh, holds for the class of all finite frames will have no bearing in terms of, well, uh, asymptotic probabilities on this subclass uh, of measure zero and vice versa. So that no results can be transferred in either direction. And so therefore it is quite possible that zero one low can survive in some interesting classes of, of frames. Uh, and it is one question which I have not uh, explored yet. Uh, but so, well, in any case, if the zero one law holds and if, if there is a transfer here more interestingly, then that would boil down to axiomatizing the model logic of the respective analog of the countable random frame when relativized to the class F, uh, if, if such a ran countable random frame exists. And so there are some promising recent results of that type that were announced by Rineke Fabruk uh, already two years ago. Uh, as far as I know, she's still busy writing, completing that paper, but she, she did such study in particular for the model probability logic and two um, cousins, as she calls them, versions of geographic logic, where things seem to be considerably easier because uh, the, uh, let's say, re restricting these questions on the class of, uh, let's say, finite partial orderings, it seems to make things generally quite easier. And there are some results about the countable random partial order that makes it quite sort of easy to, to deal with it. But I'll, I'll not go into more details. Well, next 
if we are not so much interested in model logic, then we can just go beyond model logic and still look at the problems of axiomatizing the almost sure validity in the finite for universal monadic second order logic, for instance, or existential monadic second order logic, or even the full monadic second order logic from graphs and digraphs and another important classes of structures that naturally arise. And as far as I know, the, no one has even looked at these problems and that it, it is very likely that uh, answering these problems might require some complicated combinatorial probabilistic computations uh, that would prove almost sure existence or no existence of some partitions, uh, in particular if we are in the universal, in the existential monadic uh, second order logic. I still believe that the key axioms here are the type of existence for the existential case, respectively non-existence for the universal case of certain special kind of kernel partitions, uh, like the ones that I considered here. But these are so far just speculations. And in general, little is known so far about these theories. And I think that these are major challenges, uh, both for logicians and for, for uh, people working in, in um, uh, probabilistic combinatorics, for instance. So in conclusion, uh, so I hope I've convinced you that asymptotic probabilities and zero one laws and properties of random finite structures and phenomena uh, deeply, uh, 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 these are phenomena that deeply relate uh, logic, combinatorics and probability. This is not my observation, of course, that uh, is, well, it was made years ago when uh, there was a wave of results on zero one laws uh, that seems to have subsided now, but still, I think that there is a great deal of challenges and mystery there. And uh, it is specifically, I, I think that this, this field will research in the context of identifying uh, the logics of almost sure validity, because even when the zero one law fails, and it, uh, again, it, it fails easily in various extensions of first order logic, but still, the almost sure validities in the finite in, in any given logical language are well defined, and generally they define a well def uh, uh, well behaved logical theory. Well, at least well defined logical theory. So that axiomatizing such a logical theory uh, is well one uh, big sort of general challenge, and it may or may not lead to complicated combinatorial probabilistic computations, and specifically in the case of model logic. The, uh, my conjecture is that that theory is axiomatized by the characteristic formulae of all finite frames that create kernel partitions in terms of bounded morphic images, whose existence of these kernel partitions in finite frames is almost surely false. That is one way to phrase my conjecture. But still, the complete characterization of that logic is still an open problem. And likewise, for uh, extensions to universal monadic or the full MSO. So that is, in summary, my talk. Uh, I have one more point that I could make, but it's very speculative that one possible application of these questions is on somehow judging, assessing average case complexity and uh, possibly doing some algorithmic optimization. But this is sheer speculation. But if anyone, anyone is interested, ask me. Otherwise, I think that I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, we we can unmute ourselves and thank the speaker. So, very much. Спасибо за внимание. Now it's some time for questions. Uh, please. Uh, May I start uh, yes. probably with questions? Uh, the completeness, the open question about the completeness of the logic, cryptic, the cryptic, cryptic completeness, completeness of, uh -huh. of MLAS. If it is cryptic complete, then it is uh, the logic of some one frame. And then the question, is, so uh, assuming that it is cryptic complete, it is uh, the logic of some frame, what, what uh, this frame might look like? Uh, it, it will not be the FR, the random frame. No. Perhaps but, uh, I mean, this thread of uh, thought may yeah. help in realizing that it is not complete, perhaps. 
Well, uh, I mean, I can only give a generic answer. So if you take all finite frames for the model logic uh, form of sure validity, suppose you know which they are. Well, take their disjoint union, and that, I guess, would be the logic of that frame. Although, let me see now, having, so yes, um, I need to think. So the universal modality, of course, we should exclude the universal modality from the language so that now I'm not sure even in this answer. But then you uh, mean that it is the, the logic of all its finite frames. So it is the, it has the finite model property, do you? Uh, well, if, if it were Kripke complete, then my guess, which is of course not guaranteed at all, is that it would be Kripke complete with respect to its finite frames. But it might just be terribly wrong on this. That was kind of my hunch. But I, I can't even claim that. Okay. May I ask two questions? Uh, so, uh, probably these are two open questions, of course, <laughs> but just to add to your list. Uh, mm. One of them is about intuitionistic case. So, it seems to be like uh, partial orders mm -hmm. with model logic, but still there is should be completely different. At least, do you know any extra axioms? What well, is known about this? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the closest I can say uh, follows from the work and the results by Winnicke Febru. And since this work is not, uh, not yet completed and published, so that I will refrain from, well, giving any information that is there, is, it might also change. But uh, you uh, you can possibly ask Rineke directly. I mean, uh, I'm I'm waiting for her paper to be finalized and to appear. But uh, until then, uh, I cannot say more because I've not studied that question myself. But I believe that this question would be very closely related, or the answer to your question would be closely related to what she has to what she is doing done in in the context of the logic and. And, uh, really. okay. okay, thank you. Yes, and then yet another question. So once we don't have uh, the zero one law, so there can be other uh, asymptotic probabilities. Do you have any idea of what kind of probabilities may appear here? Well, so, um, okay, what I can tell you is this, that uh, for instance, uh, the zero one law for first order logic, for instance, will still hold even if you don't consider uh, uniform distribution, but you consider some sort of uh, weight bias distribution. As long as you have a fixed probability for existence of an edge or, or existence of a relation between elements, then everything goes through with uh, due modifications. Uh, on the other hand, if you consider, let's say, probabilities which are not constant, then uh, all kinds of phenomena arise there. And uh, so there are, there are some recent works by Sherlock and others that uh, I've not even tried to understand, but there are works on sparse graphs and, and, and others that, uh, that, that go way beyond, well, let's say my immediate interest and, and also my current knowledge. Uh, uh, what's other asymptotic probabilities that, I, the, I mean, if I understand correctly the question in terms of what other uh, probability measures, that is, what other pro probability spaces? Is that your question? No, no. The question oh, is that sorry. in the case of model logic, uh, uh, some uh, of, um, some properties have uh, may have not non-zero and no one. Ah, right. yes, yes, that sorry. that is what yeah. I'm asking about. Uh -huh. Sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. Now, here is something else interesting. Now, the counter example that I mentioned uh, the counter example that I mentioned by, uh, by Labart. Uh, this is again a kind of a kernel type of property, but it's a, it's a special kernel that he managed to define with the, model, with the model logic. And the formula is by no means simple one and so that I can't reproduce. But what is interesting is that that property or that formula does not have any asymptotic probability. Ah, I see. It's not. And the reason for that is also very interesting and it's strange. Um, it is that, uh, 
Look, I mentioned earlier in my talk that there are some, uh, there are some phenomena in, for instance, in graph theory that are well known, one of them being the size of the kernel in a randomly chosen uh, finite graph. So again, existence mm -hmm. of a kernel in finite directed or undirected graphs is almost surely true, unlike the case of frames. And what is interesting is that the size of that uh, kernel is with probability, asymptotic probability one, it is equal to log n. Well, it is the ceiling or the floor of log n minus log log n, right? Mm -hmm. So that yes. it's very, very close to this number, which is not an integer. Now, for some ends, this number is very close to an integer. And then the existence of a kernel is much, <laughs> so the probability for that, for these ends would be higher. And for other ends where this number is somewhere in between two <laughs> integers, it, be, it becomes lower. So that as n increases, interestingly, this property, the, the probability of this property has some sort of oscillating behavior, which is nice. extremely interesting. I actually observed this in, I did some experiments when I was trying to sort of verify my conjectures and the, the, the transfer theorem. And I did some experiments with some, some, some computerized experiments and it, they showed this, this oscillating behavior. And I couldn't believe I said, okay, there must be some error that accumulates there and that basically messes up with everything. So that uh, much later from the works of, the, uh, of Le Bas, I understood why this oscillating behavior can occur. So that all that I can tell you is that uh, even for case of plain model logic, you, you can actually define formula that, it, well, there are model formulae that have no asymptotic probability at all. And that's, it's also <laughs> quite <laughs> interesting. Good, yes, thank you. So can things we are generally then, difficult, yeah. And can we then claim that for every model formula, either it has the probability one, asymptotic probability, or zero, or does not have? Or do we have right. any other limit probabilities be, be, no, I, I don't, I don't have one. any other examples and I'm not aware of any follow-up work done on analyzing the possible <laughs> asymptotic behavior of model formulae uh, that deviates from zero and one. I do not know, but I wouldn't be surprised if let's say every rational probability can be, can be reached by, uh, mm -hmm. for instance, there is such a uh, result by Lynch for uh, first order logic with functions that you can have a property with every rational probability between zero and one. Uh, and so that there is no zero one law, but there is a sort of convergence law and in fact every, so that uh, for model logic, no, I don't know. Uh, I mean, <laughs> the fair answer is I don't know. And uh, uh, probably it would be non-trivial to come up with examples, but it's not impossible that uh, uh, the set of possible probabilities, asymptotic probabilities might be infinite or might be even dense or something like that. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, so more questions, please. I was hoping for some answers too. Oh, answers. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. For but... me, uh, it was a surprise to hear that and to read two months, uh, several months ago, that in Kripke frames, the a property that box box is a universal modality is almost is true for almost all Kripke frames. That is unbelievable. Uh, how can yes. can you explain it in simple words? Are uh, uh, opposed to the property that, as you said, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the property of having a central point uh, is almost surely uh, false. Yeah. So the first one, the diameter two. It's almost surely true because it follows from that simple extension axiom that, that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that as soon as you believe that all extension axioms are almost surely true, which again, it can be proved by uh, combinatorial estimation. So you can read Fagin's paper, but uh, so this is a particular case of an extension axiom. So that is the best explanation I can give. M now, uh, maybe regarding uh, this, yeah. sorry. Yes, maybe this uh, particular case may have a particularly simple proof. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's, I would say that for this particular case, the, the combinatorics would be simple. That is, uh, uh, the proof, I, I cannot think of a conceptually simpler proof than just doing the, you know, the honest work of computing, doing the combinatorics and then looking at the classical probability and the limit of it. 
and then you will see why that holds. And I mean, this is more or less what Fagin did, but he did it in the general case. And, uh, and still, I think he did it for, for, for graphs, but that holds for all relational structures, though the calculations are not. So anyway, this is about the diameter too. About the central point, then the argument is again simple because the existence of a central point is an existential, well, sorry, it's a sigma property. There exists a point such that for all. Now, if you look at the negation of this, it's again an instance of an extension axiom. For all x, there is a y which is not accessible in one or the other direction. This is an extension axiom, and it's almost surely true, and that explains it. Okay. Actually, I, if can I, I, it's it's not a question. It's it's maybe a comment, but but it's it's a question that doesn't. I wanted to ask if the. I wanted to mention that in Moscow, I think there is someone called Maxim Zhukovsky who is interested in such questions. And I think he recently published a paper called Existential Monadic Second or the Logic of Undirected Graphs, the Le Bars conjecture is false. And it's which conjecture you know, it by, sounds by Le Bars, the, that, that's interesting because uh, 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 yeah. Yes, I, I uh, can you send also, me a link on this? Yes, I, I also informed him about uh, about this your talk, but unfortunately he has a lecture at the same time. But I anyway, anyway, uh, I think oh. he he will uh, he will see the slides and give some oh. comments. I guess. Well, I mean, appreciate if you can put me in contact with with that person. Yeah, sure. I'd be very interested. So uh, now I was recently, just a few months ago, I got in contact with, with uh, Jean-Marie Lebas in connection with this work when I completed it. I sent it to him and then he wrote to me that he was proving a claim that uh, something about decidability of uh, MSO, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the claim was, but uh, that could be the conjecture which is uh, mentioned in this uh, paper uh, and I would like to see uh, what the story is because he didn't come back to me with a follow-up. He was actually going on holidays and then after that, I never heard from him more. I see something in the chat. Uh, is this for me? Aha, okay, good. Uh, thank you, I'll look it up. But yes, uh, is this the same Zhukovsky? Uh, yeah, I know one, one Zhukovsky is by name. He's a logician, right? No, no, he is not. No, he is. Uh, yes, he, he, he does pro statistics. Is it Maxim Zhukovsky? Maxim Zhukovsky, yes. yes. No, so I, I think I he, had, he, he, he's, I think he was a student of Andrei Rajgarovsky and yes. he started statistics. working on uh, random yeah. graphs and statistics, but now his uh -huh. papers are on yeah. logic. So yeah. he's switched into so, logic. Uh, yes, I believe that, yes, I believe that I, I know him only by some correspondence because I was an editor of some special issue uh, from CSL two, two years ago, and I think that one of the papers was quoted by him. But, well, anyway, I don't want to sort of intrude, but if he's interested, then please tell him that I'd be more than happy to get in touch and maybe try to thresh out some of these problems. And if you happen to know some ambitious and clever uh, mathematics student. <laughs> Unfortunately, now I'm in a philosophy department, so it would be a sheer abuse if I tried to employ or to attract some of my students to do this work. But yeah, so uh, there are plenty of challenges for uh, probabilistic combinatorialists here, and uh, there is much more than a PhD study here. But it's it's so difficult, possible. So. Sure. Thank you very much again. Uh, so if да, ну мы можем еще раз поблагодарить докладчика за очень содержательный, интересный доклад. Спасибо. Спасибо за внимание. Спасибо.